We just made it through the process of learning about differentiation and what exactly derivatives are. And what we found were, just as a quick recap, that a derivative is an instantaneous rate of change along a function. So if you found a one spot along a function and you found that 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 instantaneous rate of change or that slope of the derivative, you would find maybe it has some sort of steep slope. Uh, maybe it's not very steep at that point. Maybe it's zero at that point. Maybe the slope is getting steep in the positive direction. But anyhow, what, what was created when we looked at those instantaneous moments are all these little pieces can make up some sort of function. So here we have some sort of curve going on and what we're going to be doing with this study of derivatives is seeing how does that apply to helping us graph a function. So chapter 5.1 what we're going to be focus on, focusing on are extreme maximums and minimums and these are objectives below so please do take the time to read those to know where we're headed. So I just want to quickly go over this because there was a little bit of confusion that we came across when we were looking at interval notation. Interval notation describes the independent value. So most often we're looking at x. And so if you have square brackets, what that is is a defined interval with endpoints. Okay, so this right here would be saying basically if you looked at a, a xy coordinate plane, you're going to be looking at only from the point points of negative 1 to 1. So whatever is happening in this area, that's what we're going to be studying. And the other thing is the square brackets include the, the numbers that it's around. So again, this is not a point. First of all, we would never use square brackets to notate a point negative 1 comma 1. We're not talking this point down here. We're talking this entire region and we do include those points. So I'm going to even put closed dots here to say that we're going to include um, what's on those values negative 1 and 1. Open interval is going to include rounded brackets. So this would be an example of an open interval. We would be saying from negative 0 to 4 if we were looking at the number line we're going to go ahead and use an open dot at 0 and then 1, 2, 3, 4. We'd be looking at anything in this span. But what we're going to have to make sure is this rounded bracket is equivalent of an open dot. We would never include zero. So we can get closer and closer to zero, but never land on zero. Um, these do not have, they have open endpoints. So the idea is, again, you could actually never name the lowest number. Where have we used interval notation before? We've been describing increasing and decreasing intervals. We're going to be doing that some more. We've done that in do with domains in the past. And we've also looked at average velocity problems. Like this is where there was a lot of confusion when they would say, look at the interval from 1.5 to 2 and of the function f of x equals, let's say like x squared plus 1. You would actually have to plug those values in. Those would be your y values when you plugged it into your function all over and then the difference of your x's. So we would have f of 2 minus f of 1.5 and that was an average average velocity problem so that's where we've seen it but now what we're going to be doing is analyzing certain parts of functions or graphs and they're going to specify that range with interval notation so you're going to be seeing a lot of intervals interval notation in this section be aware that we're not talking points all right, another important definition is the definition of extrema. Extrema are simply minimums and maximums over a given interval. So they're going to be defining a certain interval for you, and what you're going to have to try to figure out is where the minimums and maximums occurring. There are two types. There's an absolute and a relative. Absolute extrema. Think about it in terms of the word absolute. It's, it is the king of kings. It is the top dog or it's the bottom bottom dog, I guess. So um, if we're talking maximum, this is actually what your book on page 315 defines it to be. And I'm just going to interpret it. If you want to take a break and pause me for a second to try to interpret yourself, go for it. But in English, that C, the value of x equals C, is going to be your maximum if when you plug it into your function, it's greater, that y value is greater than all other y values. Again, we're going to be looking for an x value that whose y is greater than any other y values when you plug in those other x's. Okay? Um, and then minimum, it's just the opposite. That 
C value when you plug it in to your function um, that it would get you the smallest Y uh, that's less than all other Y values over that interval. So to actually see what I mean by this, let's consider the interval from 0 to 3. This is closed of this particular function. I've graphed it down below. And I'm going to just close off what we don't need here because I'm only looking at it from 0 to 3. And keep in mind we are going to close these. Um, it is included. We have defined endpoints. If I wanted to find what are my extrema, well let's go ahead and first find the maximum. The maximum would be, you can just see on this graph right here, at x equals 3, because at x equals 3, if you plugged that in, you're going to get the y value that's greater than any others. So f of 3 is greater than or equal to, technically, any of the other y values that you would so choose to plug in. Here we can find that maximum point. Well, it's at 3 comma, and then plug in your 3 to this function. It's going to be 3 squared minus 2 times 3 plus 2. This is going to be 5. So the extreme value theorem is going to state this. If f is continuous on a closed interval, so there's no breaks going on. It's just that smooth flowing from a to b. Just like in this, we had smooth flowing from 0 to 3. There was no breaks. What we can say is that f has a minimum or maximum. And what I would like you to consider, this seems a little bit obvious, but what I would like you to consider is if we didn't close those intervals, we kept them open from 0 to 3. Okay, you can look at this. Um, I could actually never nail the highest x value. In terms of the absolute extrema, the one that I have the most problem with is absolute maximum. What I would like you to try to do is come up with a x value that when plugged in is going to give you the the highest y, but I bet you tomorrow I would be able to challenge it and say, nope, I could choose an x value that's going to produce a larger y. So absolute maximum does not exist in this problem, but an absolute minimum would. So I just want you to kind of consider this theorem right here and just use its counterpart that if it weren't closed like this, then we wouldn't have a minimum or maximum. So kind of use the opposite truth to figure out the truth of this theorem and what it's stating. If it's a closed interval like this, we will get one absolute minimum and one absolute maximum, guaranteed. So relative extrema, this is going to be on page 315. A more formal definition is there, but the relative extrema is going to actually be, for informal definition, the peaks and the hills. So we're going to be looking at basically, um, I mean, this right here isn't the highest. It isn't going to be the x value that one plugged into the function produces the largest y. It's not the absolute extrema, but it is a relative extrema because it is relatively high compared with a lot of the other x or y values. So what does this have to do with the derivative? Uh, at this point, you're just saying, oh, this kind of seems common sense, but how are we going to do or use the derivative to help us find these points? I would like to use this particular program and this is a graph of a sine function and what you can see is there's a lot of relative minimums and maximums occurring here. And what this allows me to do is drag along this function and it's going to show you that tangent line. So as I'm moving towards this peak, what I just want you to notice is well, we're sitting with a positive slope of the tangent lines, and they're getting slowly um, less steep. And right here, as we round that corner, I hope you can see that something special is going to happen. It happens right there, and then we're going to start getting negative, um, at first kind of shallow negative slopes, and then they're going to get pretty steep. Then as we draw more tangent lines, they're going to level off again, and as we round that peak, uh, we have a derivative that is equal to zero, or in other words, this is a horizontal line, so this is going to have a slope that is equal to zero, and therefore our derivative is equal to zero. So again, it does that every single time we round these corners. So please do revisit this if you would like to, to make that connection of exactly how, what our derivatives have to do with these, these um, relative extremas. So I'm going to go ahead and post up this last slide, and this will end the lesson 
lesson portion of the chapter 5 notes. And this, what we're going to be doing is guidelines for finding extrema on a closed interval is you're always going to be wanting to look for the critical numbers. Oh, by the way, what are critical numbers? Critical numbers are the values of x for which the derivative f prime of x is either equal to 0 or undefined. So we're interested in these because what happens when the derivative is equal to 0? We saw that the derivatives were horizontal at those peaks and those valleys. And so the derivative being equal to 0 is going to tell us the x values at which we're going to be having for our function peaks and valleys. So guidelines again, find the critical numbers. You're going to be looking at the derivative, setting the derivative equal to 0 or undefined. Then at those x values, we're going to evaluate f, or our function, at each of those critical numbers in the interval. Evaluate, at, evaluate or in other words, plug in the endpoints as well, because we might be having maximums and minimums at the endpoints. And then we're going to pick out what is the smallest output and what is the largest output for our maximums and minimums. In the next video, what I will be showing you are examples of what I mean by all of this.